Namaskar welcome to this edition of the India Foundation podcast this edition of the podcast features the conversation between Mr Kom Carpentier and Mr Stephen Bassett Mr Kom Carpentier is a consultant at the India Foundation and Mr Stephen Bassett is the founder and director of the Paradigm Research Group Washington DC this discussion is on the theme disclosure for India from America let's begin Good morning, namaste from New Delhi to Washington DC, where uh, I see the city is awakening. Uh, our guest, uh, Stephen Bassett uh, of Paradigm Research Group, uh, has been kind enough to wake up early for us. And I can say as an introduction uh, that he's in the thick of the action there in the federal capital amid some very uh, eventful uh, days that are uh, changing a lot of things in the world and in the United States as well. And I am going to jump right into the topic that we are going to address. Uh, Stephen, you have been following for many years with great perseverance, uh, the very, uh, I would say, ponderous and the very uh, exotic issue of uh, contacts and interactions and observations uh, between uh, both state and private entities and what is conventionally known as the extraterrestrial factor uh, in terms of uh, both technologies as well as uh, paranormal phenomena. Now, in the last few uh, years, a number of official revelations have come, including some from the Pentagon uh, involving uh, videos made by uh, Air Force pilots. And uh, there has been also a lot of some congressional action. Now, for those who, have, uh, who are familiar with this uh, topic, they know that this kind of uh, limited release of information has taken place for quite a few years, in fact, for quite a few decades. We go back to World War II and even before, and yet, after all those years, there is still uh, so much confusion, so much ignorance, and so much questioning about what's really going on. So I'm going to ask you to begin with, why do you think there is such a relatively large amount of information coming out now, including statements by Senator Marco Rubio after a hearing was held that he's very concerned about uh, unknown craft um, overflying US military facilities. And he even went so far as to say that he would hope that these are extraterrestrials and not uh, represent, I mean, forces of a hostile power. Good morning from Washington, Combe. Thank you for uh, getting in touch. Um, let me first say that uh, the Chinese curse uh, is certainly proved true again, namely that one can live in interesting times, and that is the case. Secondly, uh, I've now been in fairly strict isolation for 124 straight days. So if I look a little ragged, uh, I apologize in advance. Your question, touches on some extraordinarily complicated uh, uh, matters going on. Let me see if I can couch it in a somewhat comprehensive way. Look, right now in the United States, to some degree globally as well, there are three very high level, uh, profound historical processes underway or historical events simultaneously. Uh, one of them is pol very political in the United States. We're going through a profound political period with numerous crises. Other nations have experienced the same thing, but it's a little new for, uh, uh, I think, the American people. Uh, I've, I've been through a lot of presidencies, saw some intense things, Vietnam War, protest, and so forth. But this is a little bit different. And so uh, we've been dealing with that for the last three and a half years. And there's all kinds of chaos going on. Uh, the media is absorbed. The people are not happy. Uh, there's a great deal of tension. Okay, so there's that. 
Uh, secondly, we are dealing with a uh, social justice movement, which has uh, more recently really intensified, uh, putting enormous amount of pressure on the government, uh, and is also uh, exacerbated by the fact that people have been in quarantine, people are losing their jobs, uh, uh, there's a whole lot of personal pain, and so the anger level is increased, and that is a serious problem. And then third, the disclosure process, which you were referring to, small d, this process of revelation regarding the extraterrestrial presence, which is the issue at hand here, the issue that I've been dealing with, uh, not as a researcher, but as a activist, a political activist, so I'm engaging the fact of an extraterrestrial presence and the government's position on it as a disclosure advocate. So that is coming to a head as well. So all three of these things are moving forward at the same time. And let me tell you, it is a very fraught period for the United States and also globally. So to, to answer your initially, basically answer your question, there is what I call a truth embargo that has been in place for 70 years. It used to be called the UFO cover-up. We try not to use UFO, UFO anymore. We use UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. It means exactly the same thing as UFO, but it doesn't carry the 65 years, 70 years of ridicule baggage and derision baggage that was heaped on the acronym UFO by the by the, uh, the authorities deliberately in order to isolate the issue. So the truth embargo was the, the government's effort to ensure operating from a democratic republic, not from an authoritarian state where one can do all kinds of things to people to keep them silent but successfully has contained the issue from being formalized. In other words, the issue whose name shall not be spoken. Um, and as of today, uh, 70, uh, how many, 73 years, all very, with, within a couple of weeks from the Roswell crash, which was the absolute beginning of the government's certain awareness of the ET presence, we still have not got that confirmation from any nation any head of state of any nation, which is what disclosure capital D is, a formal head of, a head of state formally confirming to their citizens that yes, there's an extraterrestrial presence. That is called disclosure capital D. I'll take credit for that term, right? 70 years. Okay. Well, so the I'll activists- add, uh, If I may just uh, interrupt you for a second. Yes, uh, I think that some uh, previous presidents have come pretty close uh, if you care to believe them. And even President Trump lately told his son that he had learned some very interesting things about Roswell. But of course, it always stopped one step uh, before full acknowledgement. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll comment on that. But uh, the closest we have come, we've come close a couple of times, but the closest we came with was the campaign of 2016. Hillary Clinton uh, without getting into the political pluses and minuses here. Hillary Clinton was prepared to disclose. I'm almost certain of this. And uh, uh, there were plans afoot there that would have probably brought disclosure in uh, early 2017. That is the closest we came. We had uh, a moment there when during the uh, Bill Clinton administration, uh, 93 to 2001. But uh, you're right. Uh, there's been a, And there's been the odd reference here and there but um, um, it hasn't happened. So starting in uh, the uh, 2017, the political crisis in America begins and is deepened with each passing year. All right. But something else happened. The, the, the military intelligence complex in the United States, unbeknownst to me, I wasn't aware of this, had privately made plans to make a move uh, and a maneuver, I guess you could say. And that maneuver was unprecedented. Essentially, members of the military intelligence complex, either upon leaving or having left their government employee, direct government employee, formed a private organization, what we call an NGO, 
called the To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. We now refer to it as the To the Stars Academy or TTSA. They formed that and then ult ultimately launched it in October of 2017. I believe the intent was to launch it after Clinton's election in 2016, probably before the inauguration and after the election. And that took off from the AATIP initiative uh, headed by uh, the then uh, Speaker of the House, right? Uh, not then, but uh, in, not, in, not in 2017, but, but the, they launched it and made it clear that they intended to engage the issue in a broad number of ways. And that was on their website, to the Stars Academy, it's easy to find. Yeah. Uh, and they launched it powerfully. Uh, in fact, the plan, I think, was certainly to launch and then provide significant information to the New York Times to reveal to the public extraordinary uh, uh, info uh, that would escalate the issue substantially. And the most significant thing, I believe, uh, that they provided to the New York Times was gun camera films from naval aircraft intercepts of UAPs that were declassified by, deliberately declassified by the Department of Defense, provided to Lou Elizondo to then give to the New York Times for the TTSA, to give to the New York Times for the articles that were now, now famously published in December of 2017. At the same time, they also confirmed that there was a program, ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, that ran for about uh, five years funded by money provided by a, at the time, going back to 2007, um, the uh, uh, Senate Majority Leader. So this was a big deal. People didn't know about that. It revealed the involvement of Bob Bigelow and so forth. This was a huge story, which under a different president, under a different time, would have exploded as global story worldwide and undoubtedly triggered multiple congressional hearings. But because of the political crisis going on, Oh, I, by the way, I left out a significant historical event going on, forgive me, uh, completely, simultaneous with the disclosure events happening, simultaneously with the political crisis, we are on the first full-blown pandemic, global pandemic, in a hundred years. All right, that's happening as well. All right, so these are interesting times. And so uh, the... Uh, stories of the New York Times, they didn't create an explosive event in congressional hearings. They were absorbed by the circumstances. Which but that leads me to another uh, question that many people have. We have seen over the years, in fact, over the decades, many uh, sort of releases of very uh, interesting and undisputable information to many media, mainstream media, as well as uh, books and uh, other of course. forms of communication. And yet, every time there has been, after a little while, complete silence again. So one wonders if it is part of the organized uh, process to keep uh, the information uh, secret, or if it is just uh, public indifference because people are just uh, too disconnected from that reality and they can't quite relate to it. Uh, think of it this way. Uh, the disclosure event is like uh, at the bar in the high jump. In order to get disclosure, capital D, you need to jump over that bar. The political institutions, the journalistic institutions, and so forth need to jump over that bar, and thus we'll get an announcement from heads of state. You either clear it or you don't. And for the last 70 years, we have not been able to clear that bar, to jump over it. We've always fallen short. And you fall short, that's it. You don't, you don't get a score, the bar remains up. So what the movement has been trying to do is to create the circumstances, the threshold, to clear that threshold. And so what happened in 2017, in October 11th, when the TTSA formally announced itself, that was an unprecedented event. Nothing like it had come close. In other words, as of that moment, because the members of the TTSA and that group would not have come to be at all unless there was a substantial support group within the military intelligence complex in the U.S. permitting them to do so. 
There was no way this was a rogue group of people who had all these clearances and worked for the CIA and the DOD and and uh, the skunk works at Lockheed and so forth, just decided to put this together. And do, no way. They were green lighted by us, uh, enough people in the military intelligence complex providing cover for them to proceed. In other words, protecting them against those in the military intelligence complex, which almost certainly opposed this private group coming together. All right. And so at that moment, and I said this publicly at the time, at that moment, October 11th, 2017, the disclosure movement, small d, was now being led by the military intelligence complex of the United States. And that was unprecedented. And so we had crossed a major uh, line there. We had moved to another level. And so we were approaching the threshold. In fact, we were so close that I think we were literally at disclosure because something I haven't mentioned, uh, during the campaign of 2015-16, more coverage of the ET issue in connection with the candidate, Hillary Clinton, occurred than ever before. And that was my doing. I was orchestrating that from Washington, D.C., working with journalists, working with my publicist, driving the story into the media. And, and even now receptive. at my website, you there's are a very receptive, uh, sorry, in the person of John Podesta, right? He was also uh, Podesta, very interested. Yeah. During her campaign, Podesta spoke to the ET issue. Bill Clinton spoke to it. Obama spoke to it. Hillary Clinton spoke to it. This was unprecedented. There were over 500 articles in mainstream media written about the connection of the candidate who was considered to be a, a win, a, a lock, yeah. right? Uh, and that had never Sorry. happened before. And, yeah. so, and so behind that, the TTSA was being formed, the, the group was being put together. So you see how close we were getting. We were approaching a situation where a candidate was going to be elected president who had a 20-year connection to the issue that had been outed in papers all over the world, and then a group from the Pentagon uh, people from the bank had to form a private group that brings forward major stories to the New York Times. Disclosure was going to happen in 217. But the election went another way and thus began a whole different situation. The TTSA literally stepped back and it took them 11 months to regroup and make the decision to come forward. All right. So that's happening. Now, as time has gone by, we have learned more about the TTSA's operations. And they have done things. They have they have slowed down, I believe, their game plan, but they have continued to put things out. Most significantly, the unidentified series on History Channel, which is available around the world. We're now in the second season, so there's now been nine episodes. And that what we've learned. To, I'm sorry. That brings me to a very interesting aspect of this entire uh, issue, which is the enormous amount of money and talent invested in extraterrestrial related movies for the last 70 years at least. And yeah. clearly, you can't make so many big budget movies on this topic, good, bad or indifferent, without intending at some point to make people aware at least of the possibility or likelihood that something is real behind it. Now, mm -hmm. the question, of course, is that uh, the term that's familiar is uh, limited hangout, which is supposed to be the CIA's technique to let people know that perhaps something is going on, but with plausible deniability, so that they can keep saying, well, you know, it's fiction, so think of it as you wish. That has, been, that has happened over the last 70 years, but that's not what's going on with the TTSA. Um, think of all of the efforts by the disclosure movement in the public domain that research the thousands of books, the documentaries that would come out year after year after year, right? Press conferences, my ex-conferences, the citizen hearing on disclosure in 2013, which I put together, the National Press Club. Think of all of these things as effort to clear the bar, but they didn't. They, they weren't enough to clear that threshold, all right? What's happened with the TTSA has substantially gotten as close as to clearing that bar. Right? So we're very close. In other words, we're like the athlete. We've, we, we, we've, we've added some more uh, training and, and improved our speed, and now we're getting a little closer, and the TTSA is leading it. And so, so that's not a limited hangout. 
that was part of uh, a effort organized from within the, de the Department of Defense to assist and lead the public disclosure movement. They're kind of taken over. They're, they're, they're pointed the spear. And so the TTSA had to back off, but they, they couldn't just stop. And so they have done a number of things. The unidentified show, and then, and this is the most important thing, this is why I relocated back to Washington, got an office at the National Press Building two blocks from Washington, D.C., uh, the Capitol, rather, the, uh, the White House, forgive me, and are preparing to start a, and preparing to start a podcast in a week or so, the first podcast on this issue out of Washington, D.C., ever, because they have been briefing people behind the scenes in Washington, committee chairs and members of Congress, privately, not for public discussion, without press conferences, on the subject. Why? They are preparing for congressional hearings. And the leader of that is Christopher Mellon, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Intelligence, uh, Defense for Intelligence, rather. Uh, he's the key person there. And these meetings have been going on. We don't know how many, but it's been alluded to scores. And that's been happening privately. And then the Unidentified series has been presenting witnesses government witnesses adding on to the witnesses that were presented regarding the Nimitz event, which right. was the centerpiece of the initial launch of the TTSA. The event in 2004 where the Nimitz aircraft carrier group encountered scores of these uh, uh, craft and uh, got them on on video. And so now let me sorry, let me just here clarify something which may not be known to the people who are watching us. When you are talking about uh, extraterrestrial craft or unidentified uh, flying objects or unidentified aerial phenomena, you are talking about craft that far exceed all the known capabilities of our own most advanced jets sure. and aircraft. Yes. You are talking about speeds that go into the tens of thousands of miles in some cases. You are talking about some craft that can go both underwater and in the air and in space. And you are talking about incredibly high G turns. Uh, without any perceptible slowing down, which means that these objects seem to move as it were in a different space time, as if they were literally stepping out of our space time and coming back into it. Now, the reason I'm saying this is that the implications are tremendous as far as both our cosmology and our technology. The first needs to be probably radically revised in its present state, and the second, the technology, uh, is getting or should be getting a huge boost from the ability to in some way understand and replicate the performances of these objects. But here, of course, I'm dealing with one of the enduring mysteries, how much of it has been done in places like Area 51, so well known to movie buffs, and how much of it is still just not uh, available because we haven't been able to pierce these secrets. So that's where the issue of actual connection or contact between certain corporate or government entities on our side and some of the extraterrestrial visitors or so-called alien visitors, if you don't want to call them extraterrestrial, did that really happen or are we still gazing into some mystery? Well, you've raised the question, uh, one of the key exopolitical questions, which is what have we learned from the presence of these craft going back 70 years? Have we gotten vehicles? Have we re-engineered? and so forth. Perfectly legitimate question. Let's just put that aside just for a second, because we're not going to find out with any clarity, with any certainty about that until a disclosure event, a formal acknowledgement has taken place. We're just not going to get that information. But let's go back to what you were just, we were just talking about. You know, what the TTSA is, is, is powerfully bringing forward is clear information and they're getting hundreds of witnesses that are approaching them behind the scenes. Witnesses that every everybody in the field would have loved to have had opportunity to talk to, but just simply did not have the credentials that the To The Stars Academy has. It's operating from a very substantial platform of government background and imprimatur. And so we, we could not get to those witnesses. There some have come to, to, to our researchers, but no, they've got hundreds that have come forward. And these things, these witnesses are being lined up for the hearings that are inevitably going to come. And one of the centerpieces that they're presenting is these craft are capable of doing extraordinary things. 
thousands of miles an hour, right turns, go straight up to 80,000 feet in a half a second. And they're presenting that as, well, that is something that uh, doesn't appear that humans can do. But they're not saying they're extraterrestrial. In fact, they're not even allowed to say they're extraterrestrial under, I think, the the game, the rules of the, the road, the rules of, of, of the engagement that they have been provided to do what they do. They have to stay short of that. But let's be clear. We have we were seeing those kinds of activities and they were reported not just in 2004, but in 1990, 1980, 1970, 1960, 1940. And so while people may be alluding to the fact, well, maybe they're Chinese drones or maybe it's a corporation that's had a breakthrough, we were seeing this kind of, of technology and actions in the 50s and 60s where the idea that humans had that kind of technologies was utterly absurd. And so let's be clear. I'm a political activist. I'm not a researcher. My job is to get to the point. My job is to make it clear what's going on from a political perspective. And what's going on from a political perspective is this. There is absolutely an extraterrestrial presence. It's an absolute fact. Every single person connected to the TTSA knows that. They can't say this, but I can. All right. And the disclosure process is about finally confirming that presence. All right. And so, uh, uh, I'm excited that we're moving closer, but we're still in this extraordinary situation. So the TTSA has is preparing for hearings, has witnesses lined up, has brought some of those witnesses forward in the unidentified program. And not surprisingly, there have been some other developments. Some people on the Hill have I believe probably not supposed to, but have have gotten a little ahead of their skis. One of them was Mark Walker, a Republican congressman who was briefed by people connected to the TTSA and got a little excited and sent a letter to the secretary of the Navy, Spencer, saying, what's going on here? Why don't we know more? And the secretary uh, responded with a letter that wasn't satisfactory to Mark Warner, Mark Walker, rather. And he then sent another letter back. Shortly after that, the Secretary of the Navy was fired, and we haven't heard from Mark Walker since. Mark Warner, the ranking member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, did mention that he was briefed, and that was noted. All right. A couple of other uh, members of Congress, including Senator Shaheen, Democrat, mentioned that she was briefed. These are just a few that mentioned it, but we know that many more have been briefed by by either Elizondo or Mellon and some of the pilots and or mix it up any way you want. OK, just recently, Mark Rubio did something else. He is the the uh, the, the head of the Intelligence Committee. And with or without Senator Warner's involvement, Marco Rubio, who is not up for election, made an interesting maneuver. He inserted in the Defense Intelligence Appropriations Bill a statement, clause, demand, that the UAP task force, which we didn't know existed at the uh, Office of Naval Intelligence and other elements of the Department of Defense, needed to provide information about how they're addressing and cataloging and dealing with the UAP phenomena within 180 days of the passage of this bill. Well, what's important about that is that that bill is not going to be signed for a while, maybe late August. And so the soonest the, uh, the Department of Defense needs to respond to that legal demand is well into next year after the election. And right. so for me, this was a maneuver by Rubio to get ahead of the issue, all right, and without really taking much political risk. However, that triggered another article from the New York Times. Now, let's get to the media on this. Let's get to, get to, get to some of the other developments. The media has covered this issue. Uh, there's no question. I've got at my website, paradigmresearchgroup.org, over 500 articles earmarked. You can, you can check them off. You can go see them. Related to the to the Stars Academy and all developments related to the to the Stars Academy and put and the news coverage of it and so there's been news coverage significant news coverage yes, yes. and and the it's Navy all over the, the Navy yes all over the world meanwhile the Navy has been under great pressure 
because the the Nimitz event and the Roosevelt event, these gun camera footage, which were released to the New York Times in 2017, October or December, uh, all involved Navy events and thus revealing to the public that the Navy had been sitting on this for years, 14 years at minimum. And that put them in a really tough spot. And so the Navy has responded. The Navy, under pressure, ultimately, uh, 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 decided to revamp the uh, protocols for reporting these things. That got covered by the New York Times. They then acknowledged formally, months later, that those uh, films released by the TTSA were legitimate. Yes. Eventually, the Defense Department, under pressure, had to acknowledge that they were legitimate. That generated more news. So this has just been bumping along. Has it reached the threshold to clear the bar for disclosure? No, obviously it hasn't. All right. But right. things but are heating up. Are, yes, the situation we are dealing with now is that most of the public really believes that it's at least highly possible, if not certain, Correct. that yes. there are certain things going on which are far above the official reality that is being revealed. And therefore, uh, whether or not they believe people are coming, some entities are coming from other planets or from parallel dimensions or maybe from the future, that is now becoming a certainty in many people's minds, except for those, of course, who for all sorts of reasons, religious or otherwise, refuse to contemplate that. But if you look, for example, at India, where I am located, as you know, it's part of the Indian tradition and civilization that there are many different sorts of uh, beings that inhabit different worlds. You can call them devas or gods, you can call them demigods, you can call some of them rakshasas or uh, asuras who are supposed to be more devilish, but they are around and they come and go and they appear and disappear and they intervene in human affairs. And that tradition goes back thousands of years and you find the similar traditions on most continents. So that tells you that we are going back in some way to a rationalized mythological age. And that is a very important and very revolutionary message because it challenges many of our concepts about rationality and scientific reality. You know, it shows that we cannot limit it to what we thought it was, let's say, two centuries ago or even 50 years ago. Let's just say that uh, I'm a pretty simple guy. I'm just a country activist. You know? I, I, uh, uh, whatever one thinks of ancient aliens, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. And I think ancient aliens, uh, in a very legitimate way, has clearly put forward uh, so enough evidence uh, to confirm that the inter interaction between us and these non-human entities goes back thousands of years. Uh, as far as wherever they're from, uh, the fact that they're here is what's most important. Disclosure is about the formal acknowledge of this presence, extraterrestrial, right? So whether they come from the future or another dimension doesn't matter. They weren't born in New Delhi. They weren't born in New York. They weren't born on this planet, right? And so that's what's important. Working out all of these interesting and fascinating um, uh, aspects will have a decent chance in the post-disclosure world. But until we get to that world, until we cross the, the disclosure threshold, it's all going to be interesting speculation. And of course, the technology issue is pretty hard. That's basic, it's nuts and bolts. And so uh, for the average person in this world, what kind of technology we've garnered from those ETs, what could be revealed in the post-disclosure world has enormous implications about whether that life is going to be uh, bearable in the 21st century. So. Let's get now bound to the nitty gritty. With all of this going on, a global pandemic, a major critical crisis in the United States that many consider existential, right? Significant unrest because there's also a, 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 a social justice movement that's, that's, a, that's grown up. And of course the disclosure movement. What most I think people and journalists who are now taking this all in are not thinking about, but my job is to think about, is that when this thing breaks, one of the most important facts 
that we will be dealing with, one of the most important aspects is who is president? Who is prime minister? Who is the king of the head of, of, of their country at that time? Because once disclosure will probably come from a single country, a single country will make the first move. The announcement will be made. It will be backed up by evidence. It will go worldwide and then other nations will follow suit very quickly. Now, but the first head of state to go forward obviously will get the greatest glory. So we'll call that person the disclosure head of state. Who the disclosure head of state is, is non-trivial. It is extremely important here. Uh, that head of state will achieve worldwide fame, glory, acknowledgement, and substantial power. That head of state will be considered the de facto leader in the post-disclosure world as we try to learn all of the rest of the information that governments have accumulated for 70 years. Now, and that, head state, that head of state can only be someone who is very aware and properly briefed about the evidence, and clearly that puts some countries at an advantage over others. Let me tell you three, three things in this regard before I ask a final question, because unfortunately we have to wrap it up. The first is that there have been quite a few UFO sightings or UAP sightings in India. I was involved in uh, some of the government process uh, connected to that, particularly over the Himalayas on the border with China. And there was an acknowledgement at the highest level that this was happening, but there was no, no desire to go further, at least in public. Second, I have a very high level, an impeachable Russian source who told me that back in the 60s, well, maybe, yeah, 60s, uh, the Politburo and his father was in, personally in charge of the dossier, had learned that the Americans had made a deal with one alien race or entity and that they decided this was very dangerous for their national security because the Americans would not really share the information, especially after Kennedy was assassinated. Take it or leave it. And that leads me, uh, leads me to my question. A great deal of worry can be generated or is even already present in some people's minds about what this extraterrestrial presence means for the future. Are we looking at an invasion process or are we just looking at something much more benign, which may take the form of some infiltration through artificial intelligence and quantum computing, you know, those things that are happening now. Uh, what is your view on that? Do you think we are moving towards an actual, somehow an encounter, peaceful or not, with uh, certain, because we know there are several different types, but certain, in alien uh, entities? Or do you think this is just a phenomenon which has been there with us for, for a very, very long time and which will continue to remain in the background of reality? There are hundreds of theories and speculations about what has happened for the last 70 years. They're all interesting. Each one has a certain amount of evidence, but we are not going to know for sure what has happened in the last 70 years until we crossed the threshold clear the bar. Until we have formal confirmation from the heads of state, we can just speculate ourselves till the end of our lives. That's not acceptable. All right. So I can't really respond to that. Uh, I mean, I can I can speculate about what might happen. I do it all the time. We could spend three hours on that. But I think the key focus is this. We're going to have to get disclosure in order to get that information. And we are close to disclosure. But Right now, there is a problem because everyone inside the Department of Defense, all of the members of the To the Stars Academy, all of the researchers, including myself, know that disclosure at this point, if it happens, will happen under President Donald Trump. If it does not take place, then it may, we may be in a position to have it happen under a new administration, that would be President Biden. So that's what we are looking at now. That is a factor in the equation that I assure you is not being talked about publicly because that's verboten, right? For those involved, particularly those that are connected to uh, military intelligence complex or the politics or anything else. I'm a political activist, I can say a damn thing I want and I will. 
So that is a major consideration. I can assure you that the difference between a Donald Trump as the disclosure president and the leader of the post-disclosure world and a Joe Biden is non-trivial. So the election, so so you're going to see that there's going to be a how would you say uh, there is until until the election takes place. There's a lot of decisions that can't really be made. Once that election takes place and we know the situation for the next four years, then it'll be possible for uh, the TTSA and others to make their decision as to when and what they're going to do. But until then, we're in the middle of a political and a pandemic crisis that has got us pinned down, which is fine. You don't want to try to introduce the most profound event in human history and have to make the most profound political decision in human history in the middle of a global pandemic when people can barely even leave their offices or homes and you've got political constitutional crisis rife in the most powerful nation in the world. But let me be clear, there are a limited number of nations that could end this embargo immediately, right? Meaning the head of state could take it on their own. Let's do this. Certainly India is one of them. Modi could do this. Certainly Putin could do this. Xi Jinping could do this. Uh, uh, Boris Johnson could do this. There are a limited number of nations so significantly significant, and most of them are nuclear powers, not surprisingly. Will they choose to do it? I don't know. Uh, well, in this regard, uh, I have uh, followed some of the noises coming out of China. And as you probably are aware, there is an initiative in China called the Five Continents Initiative, which is under the patronage of uh, Mrs. Peng Yuan the first Correct. lady of China. And mm -hmm. I believe the Chinese, it's been acknowledged by the CIA years ago in one of its reports, at least, that the, the Chinese have been spending a lot of time doing research on alien technology or UAP technologies, whatever they, they were able to gather out of that. So I believe the Chinese are also a factor. And perhaps of course. it's actually the, the activities of China in this field, which have motivated certain people in America to move forward towards disclosure, not to be caught napping at that point and find the Chinese mm -hmm. are actually taking credit for uh, certain things. You know, Absolutely. Look, we, we are to some degree, uh, there, there may be a disclosure race going on. There may be a technology, uh, ET technology development race going on. We don't know because all of these major nations have huge intelligence military complexes operating secret programs. The vast, what I call the secret empire, where there's a whole lot going on that we are simply not allowed to know, which could have enormous implications for the human race. This is not an acceptable situation and needs to be reformed, but it's pretty big deal. This is really complicated and everybody want, I know most people want to try to simplify it and, and put it into a package that they can get their mind around, but it's not a package that small. I. I'm just an activist in, in the middle of all this, trying to see what's going on. But I can tell you that it is so much bigger than anyone really has described to date. And the outcome is very uncertain because there are so many variables. It is a differential equation with a hundred variables. I, I don't know which nation will go first. I don't know when it will happen, but I do know this based upon what's happening in the United States, based upon what I know about, it is extremely close. Now, what, what's the situation with Biden? Let, let me tell you what your, your listeners or viewers need to know about Biden. Understand something. Hillary Clinton was going to disclose if she won. That I'm almost certain of, and I can make a very profound case for that. She's a Democrat. Biden's a Democrat. Biden is connected to Clinton. Biden is fully in touch with her. He, she was secretary of state. He's vice president. He, uh, he, uh, John, John Podesta has had contact with, with Biden. He was an advisor to, uh, to Obama in most of his last year and a half while, again, Biden was president. Biden has been briefed about the Clintons desire to disclose by the Clintons, I assure you. Now, he has said nothing about this, not surprisingly. He does not have a public connection to the issue, and he's not going to want to bring that up. He's got enough of a complicated problem here. But the fact is there is a direct line, Biden back to the Clintons, back to the ET issue. And so if Biden is president, and he may not be, the, uh, there is a very comfortable situation there where he can green. Well, I say if we're looking at a Biden presidency and a fully Democratic Congress, House and Senate, 
then the basis for those those hearings that Mellon want is solid. Biden is certainly not going to block it. And what do you end up having? You end up having Biden as the disclosure president. The Democratic Party gets the glory. The Clintons are brought into the picture. They get glory. Obama gets glory. It's a huge win for the Democrats. If it happens before that, all of that disappears. So that's the, the political implications here. Because a lot of people don't get because they think the ET thing, real or not, is just a science thing or a little little wild and crazy thing and there's no politics involved. Believe me, it is incredibly political. The Im political implications are absolutely enormous. All right. Yes. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, President Trump tries to gain some advantage from it, it before is the election it, by making talking about one Trump. of his uh, unexpected statements. You know, okay, so. Let's talk about Trump. Obviously, we're watching him extremely closely. There have been three instances where he has touched on the issue. Yes. He was asked about it by Tucker Carlson because Tucker Carlson, a, uh, a conservative yes. political host, uh, is very interested in the issue, has taken it on and done more programs yes. on it than he any other show. Quite often, yes. And he has, he has uh, uh, the president's ear. And while in Japan, he asked him about it. And the president gave him a fairly modest, not particularly significant response, but he responded. Then Stephanopoulos, a serious journalist here in America, asked him about it, and he gave another relatively mild, nondescript response. But then in a, I guess you could call it an in-house interview for a podcast that they do, the president was interviewed by his son, right. Don, Don Jr., and he asked him about Roswell. Now, that was fully planned. There's no question that that, that was not just what the hell, ask me about it. And so in that sense, he wanted to say something about Roswell. And what he said was not significant, but it generated plenty of news. And now he also, we also know that he was briefed by some of the pilots. That's pretty much been confirmed. Whether yes, he, he was praised the pilots significantly. He praised the pilots. And he mentioned uh, the pilots in, in, in the uh, Tucker Carlson statement. So we're seeing the glimpses of some interaction. But I assure you that what he has said and done is nothing compared to what, for instance, the Clintons have said and done and engaged on the issue, going back some all the way to 1993. Yes, the Rockefeller so, Initiative and all that. Of Rockefeller, whom I knew, had played a big role. Unfortunately, he couldn't uh, get what he wanted out of that. So, so, so we know that, and that's fine. Does that tell me that that uh, there's something eminent? I I don't think so. Think so. More importantly, the president is involved in a intense uh, presidential election, really intense presidential election, and all of these crises and so forth. And so, it's hard for me to imagine that he would take the issue on before uh, uh, before the election. It's just hard to imagine that. But it could happen. If it does, it does. I'm trying to present the picture. I'm not trying to sell one candidate over the other. I am a neutral, right? I'm not a Democrat or Republican. But people tend to go, well, he, he wants this, he wants that. Look, I don't know who's going to be president, but I know what's going on, and I'm trying to convey that to people. What I'm trying to convey is this. Get ready for disclosure. Get ready for those congressional hearings. The bar is almost cleared on this. We could see it happen most likely after the inauguration next year, whoever is inaugurated, and not before. And on those worlds, we unfortunately have to end this uh, fascinating talk, which could go on for many hours. But oh, yes. I wish to thank my guest, Stephen Bassett, and uh, I hope we will have other opportunities. So I will also thank uh, the India Foundation and uh, our viewers, and I hope that this will have an impact on the competent Indian authorities and that uh, some more uh, discussion and thinking will be dedicated to this uh, very, very major issue here, which in some way is so much related to Indian philosophical and cosmological uh, wisdom. Thank you very much, Stephen, and have a very good day. My pleasure, Colin. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the India Foundation podcast. Do like, share and subscribe the India Foundation channel.